Hi everyone, my name is Hani. I'm a doctor from London. I don't know why I suddenly just decided to be a YouTube fave, but here we are. Um... You're not about to get on this flight, sis. I was interrogated for just under two hours. This video on hyperpigmentation has probably been the most requested video that I've had. Skincare issues that specifically affect people of colour and people with dark skin. I don't think skincare companies and pharmaceuticals send to us as the target audience to the point where like hyperpigmentation, yes, there are treatments available, but you would have to go to a dermatologist and spend lots of money to get help for that. Whereas if it's something like, I don't know, sunburn, you could buy sunburn lotion really cheaply at like your local chemist or drugstore. And I think that disparity is just, you know, a symptom of the state of the world. You know, systemic racism does exist. And I think things like that are just a symptom of that. But the reason it's extra bad is because like if you're a person of color statistically you earn less so why is it that there's a premium on skincare for people of color do you know what i mean like why is it that we have to go these really expensive routes and that there aren't products commercially available like i wanted to be a doctor because i didn't see doctors that look like me that would advocate for like people like me so so i think this is just a natural progression of that like obviously i wanted to be a doctor because i wanted to advocate for people from marginalized backgrounds and communities but also like if i create skincare videos i want my focus to be people from marginalized backgrounds who can't access information and resources as easily. When I was doing the research for this video, when I was looking at scientific journals and the scientific literature, almost all of it was about hyperpigmentation in how it affects white people. So there's a condition called melasma where um, you get hyperpigmentation, normally starts on the top of your cheekbones and then spreads across the rest of your face. But that is the main way that white people would get hyperpigmentation and Obviously, almost all people of colour get hyperpigmentation in the form of acne spots, in the form of dark skin around your mouth, dark skin around your eyes, so perioral and periorbital pigmentation. So why is it that there's so little data on that when almost all people of colour are affected by that, but there's a lot of data on melasma, which is, it can happen to people of colour as well, but that's largely the main way that white people are affected by it. What you see on the shelves in the drugstore is very white normative but i think if you take that step back and look at the scientific literature that is also white normative which is a real shame but i have been like concocting things because i have high pigmentation as well the picture in the thumbnail and the pictures you might have seen on twitter are of me and my cousin and they're real pictures they're totally unedited and we achieved a fantastic result and that was because i just thought you know what like i really went to medical school i have my master's degree like i actually do understand the data and the literature so let me just go through all of it figure out what's actually going on like what is the real tea and obviously tried it out on myself worked amazingly tried it out on my cousin worked amazingly so i just thought democratize skincare you know skincare for all so i'm sharing it on youtube and the goal is one day i would love to have a skincare brand for people of color like i just keep saying it because i'm trying to manifest it i want it to become a real thing so obviously spread it far and wide that is honey's goal um that would be the dream because i just think i want it to be an like someone from the community serving their community because as soon as people find out there's a capitalist agenda that they can manipulate so i'm not going to name names but like the big skincare brands that you see in drugstores and things like that obviously they'll make things for high pigmentation as soon as they realize it's profitable but it will be profit driven and not experience driven so yeah i've rambled but i hope you kind of get a better sense of who i am and what i'm trying to do and i hope you support the vision and if you could like and subscribe i would be very very grateful um, but yeah, let's get into it. So the first thing I want to do is explain some of the science of why hyperpigmentation happens. And then I'll get onto a routine that I want everyone to follow. I would love if you could like have a hashtag or something where I say have a hashtag, like I have, I have zero clout. Like I don't know who's going to use this hashtag, but if like I'll think of a hashtag, I'll post it in the video. But I want to see people's like improvement, if you know what I mean. Uh, so all my handles everywhere are at vote for honey and if you just tag me in your skincare or use the hashtag which will be here i want to see like your skin progress because it does work and i know because the science is there and it's worked on me it's worked on my cousin amazingly and the scientific literature supports it so i'm going to share the routine with you but i want to get into the why beforehand why hyperpigmentation happens and why you should be using these products and then i'll be giving you the products at the end okay so the first thing i want to talk about is what causes hyperpigmentation and i think if i equip you with the knowledge of why it happens then 
you'll be able to understand why I'm recommending the things that I'm recommending. And I think you'll be more dedicated to actually following and sticking to the routine if you're empowered with the knowledge to understand why you're doing each thing. So yes, there is a genetic component, but the three additive components are, well, firstly, I'll quickly talk about acne. So if you have acne, if you have spots, um, spots cause local inflammation. So if you have a spot, you're gonna have a bit of inflammation there because it is an inflammatory process. And that inflammation stimulates the melanocytes, which are the cells that produce melanin. It stimulates the melanocytes to produce more melanin. And so that's why you get a pigmented lesion when you have a spot. And so the first thing, actually, if you are someone who is coming to this video because you have hyperpigmentation caused by acne, the absolute first thing you have to do is treat your acne. Because there's no point in me telling you how to get rid of all your like acne spots and acne scarring if you're just going to get more spots does that make sense um i think i will make videos later about acne and specifically in acne and people of color and the steps they should be taking but actually what you want to do is get sort the acne out first because otherwise there's really no point because the high pigmentation takes much longer to treat than the acne itself yeah so acne causes local inflammation and that local inflammation leads to melanogenesis which is the word that means science is actually such a scam every long word just means something quite straightforward so acne causes local inflammation, which leads to melanogenesis. Melanogenesis just means creating more melanin. So that local inflammation stimulates the melanocytes, the cells that make melanin to make more melanin. And that's where you get that pigmented spot. So obviously, first things first, treat your acne before you do any of these things. So the second thing I'm going to talk about is UV exposure. So UV rays are the rays that come from the sun. And obviously, you know that sun rays make you get darker. Like you see that in tanning. But the reason that can become problematic in people of colour is because our melanocytes, the cells that make melanin, are much more active than in white people. So actually, so people sometimes ask me, do people of other races have more melanocytes than Caucasians? And actually the answer is no. We all have the same number of melanocytes roughly. But in people of darker skin, the melanocytes are just more active. They just produce and deposit more melanin into the skin. And so we are much more likely to get hyperpigmentation because our melanocytes are kind of doing a lot anyway so it's very easy to tip them into doing the most whereas in people of fairer skin people with caucasian skin their melanocytes are just kind of they're not doing too much so it becomes harder to trigger them into being more active and uv stimulates uv rays so the sun rays stimulate the melanocytes into producing more melanin in a few different ways but i'm going to talk about the two main ways so the uv rays act directly on the melanocyte and get it to produce more melanin so it's as simple as that another thing that happens with uv exposure is it causes the brain to produce more melanocyte stimulating hormone which then leads to more melanocyte production does that make sense so literally just being in the sun directly causes the cell to produce more melanin but it also goes this roundabout way where it makes the brain produce more of this hormone that makes you produce more melanin so that's why like it's a little bit peak because obviously there's two separate things happening and i've also just said the two main ways there are actually other mechanisms by which uv exposure causes increased melanin production and deposition so essentially i'm sure you can guess sunscreen is going to be a big big part of this routine so that's uv exposure the third thing that I want to talk about is hormones. Hyperpigmentation, especially as I said, periorally, periorbitally, is much more likely to happen to women. And the reason for that is, is because of female hormones, so estrogen and progesterone. Because estrogen and progesterone both increase melanin production, which is why in pregnancy people can get melasma, which is why some people will find that their hyperpigmentation gets worse if they're on estrogen containing contraceptive pills so if your high pigmentation is like really resistant to treatment or it's getting really bad like i definitely think it's worth getting a hormone profile from your doctor um so just having like your levels of hormones measured or also thinking about like have i started like a new contraceptive pill or like a new hormonal treatment that could be causing it but the other thing i want to stress is it's not actually the amount of each hormone it's the balance of them so estrogen and progesterone have to be balanced very carefully and so if you're on like these pills, it can kind of throw it out of whack. But also if you have any hormonal issues yourself, so if you have like polycystic ovarian syndrome, things like that can also cause your hormones to be out of balance. So that's something to consider. So one other thing to mention with UV exposure actually is that UVA can actually penetrate through windows and people don't realize this. So, so obviously people know that they have to wear sunscreen, but because UVA penetrates windows, 
don't sit in front of the window at home don't sit in direct sunlight even if it's through a window or your car window or whatever and if you have to if you don't have a choice just make sure you've got your sunscreen on it's as simple as that so that is a really really important thing to mention now the next thing i want to talk about is i'm going to go through a routine but i want to explain how these products work because again, if you guys know what you're putting on your face and what it's doing, I think you're actually more inclined to put it on your face and actually follow through um, if you know what it's doing and why it's doing it. So the first thing I want to talk about is how melanin is actually produced. So we spoke about how the melanocytes, the cells in the skin that make it, but I want to talk about the actual biochemical pathway by which melanin is produced. And I, this is not going to be long and complex. There's just one key thing that you have to understand. So the very first step of your body making melanin, your body has to break down this chemical called tyrosine. This is an amino acid and it's broken down by an enzyme. And I'm not going to get I'm not going to get any more technical than that because I think that's enough. But I've simplified this so, so much because it is insanely complex. But I just want you to understand the broad brush what's going on here. So there's an amino acid called tyrosine and your body has to break that down. And loads of other things happen and that and then you eventually make melanin and in people who have high pigmentation that process is just happening a little bit too much that's why you've got these overly pigmented areas and so what you want to do is if you can stop the tyrosine being broken down into all the various things that end up being melanin you can stop hyperpigmentation um, and so the enzyme that breaks down that tyrosine is called tyrosinase so that's the enzyme that we're trying to block so a lot of these products I'm going to be talking about are what we call tyrosinase inhibitors. So they are stopping that tyrosine being broken down into melanin. Okay, so, okay, that was a lot. Okay, I hope everyone is still with me. So in short, most of the products I'm going to be explaining today are what we call tyrosinase inhibitors. So they are chemicals that stop that enzyme breaking that tyrosine down into melanin. I'm going to be talking largely about using a combination of different tyrosinase inhibitors to get your hyperpigmentation in check. And so the most effective tyrosinase inhibitor is actually something called hydroquinone. And that is literally not what we finna do. Like that is not why we're here. Hydroquinone is also what some people just call like skin bleach or bleaching your skin. That is literally, that's not why we are here. I'm here to explain that it's a tyrosinase inhibitor, but it's the only unsafe one. And it's the only one, it's the most effective, yes. But with that, it is a carcinogen, so it's something that can cause cancer. It won't definitely cause cancer if you use it, but it increases your risk of cancer. It also causes rebound pigmentation, so it's extremely effective. But once you stop using it, the pigmentation comes back. It comes back worse, and it's very, very, very stubborn pigmentation that is difficult to get rid of, even with kind of this routine. And that is the point where I would probably go to a dermatologist and seek specialist advice. It also causes something called ochronosis. So ochronosis is a blue-black pigmentation. Normally, sometimes it can look a bit yellow. That appears on the skin after continued hydroquinone use. And I think a lot of you probably will have seen it. So, so it's a blue-black mottling of the skin. If you've seen people who've bleached their skin and you've seen what their skin has become like as a result, you've probably seen ochronosis. I'll include some pictures here as well. And like... Is it worth it? You know, so that's why I'm not going to be recommending anything that has hydroquinone in because of how it works on skin of colour. Because actually on white skin or Caucasian skin, it doesn't actually have nearly as bad effects. Even some dermatology formulations will have hydroquinone in because it does work, just not in, in skin of colour. So that's not something I'm going to be recommending. It's not a people of colour focused treatment. And actually it's illegal in the UK um, to formulate skincare products with that ingredient. But I think you are still able to buy skincare ingredients with hydroquinone in if you just buy them from like an American supplier. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but basically you can't use it as an ingredient in the UK if you're formulating your own products. And rightly so, I think. Um, but that's not because of what it does to skin of colour. That's because it's a carcinogen. Um, so cancer causing. So... Yes, so hydroquinone is the gold standard, it's the best treatment, but obviously, as we've discussed, it has so many side effects, causes rebound pigmentation, which is very difficult to treat, causes ochronosis, can cause um, can increase your risk of skin cancer, 
so that's not what we feel like we're not recommending that here today so the first thing i want to talk about is my other tyrosinase inhibitors and these are all safe so none of these will cause those issues so the first one is azelaic acid so azelaic acid is also a tyrosinase inhibitor so it's also blocking that enzyme that breaks down the tyrosine which was that first step to making melanin and using 10 percent up to 20 percent of azelaic acid was shown in a study to be as effective as four percent of hydroquinone so do you know what i mean let's do that Azelaic acid is also a really good one because it has a very low allergen rate. It's not something people will react like it doesn't irritate people's skin generally. It's not it's not an irritant product. So that's a really, really great place to start. So that's going to be one of the things featured in the routine. The next tyrosinase inhibitor is kojic acid. Again, this is also very potent and effective. Um, it's effective between around 1% and 4% strength kojic acid. But kojic acid can be very irritant. It can be very irritating to the skin. And that's something we want to avoid at all costs, because just remember when I was talking about the acne, I said if you have a spot that's local inflammation and that local inflammation causes increased melanocyte activity in that region, which then gives you that dark mark that gives you the spot. And the same is true for irritation. So if you irritate your skin, if you're putting things on your skin that feel really tingly and uncomfortable, like a mild tingle is often OK. But I mean, like things are off, actually you feel you feel it irritating your skin or maybe it's giving you a rash or maybe it feels uncomfortable when you put it on. You want, you want to be avoiding those things because those things are going to cause that inflammation as well, which is going to cause hyperpigmentation. So the absolute kind of connecting strand through all these things I'm going to recommend is that if you find that they're irritating your skin, it needs to stop immediately because irritation causes local inflammation. That local inflammation produces something called histamine, which leads to further pigmentation. So you want to go low, slow. You want to go gentle. I don't want anything that feels like it's irritating my skin. Um, so I'm going to give you some steps in terms of minimizing the irritation as well later. As well. So I'm also going to talk about how to minimize irritation in the treatment um, later in the video as well. But kojic acid is another really potent tyrosinase inhibitor. Between 1% and 4% works, as I said. But because I said it can be irritant at high concentrations, I think 1% or 2% is the maximum strength you should go for. So between 1% and 2%, you shouldn't be using more than that just because of its tendency to irritate. And even me, when I used it, I can't remember exactly what percentage the, this product was because obviously I stopped using it. Um, but I think it was a slight, I think it was maybe 4%. And it would literally like the cracks of my nose and like you know the crevices of your face like they would literally burn and it's like once again like this this is really not why i'm here like i'm gonna just head out so uh stopped using it obviously as you should be doing if anything is irritating you at any point so yeah between one and two percent kojic acid is the sweet spot the next thing i want to recommend in this class the tyrosinase inhibitors is vitamin c so vitamin c is very very potent vitamin c is also known as ascorbic acid one thing I kind of hate about science is that a lot of things will have more than one name. So ascorbic acid is the same as vitamin C. So if you see that, just know it's the same thing. This is digging into the chemistry here, but vitamin C um, forms what we call enantiomers. So there's two versions of it that naturally form when you make it. Um, and only one of the forms is effective as a hyperpigmentation treatment. So the two forms will be L-ascorbic acid and D-ascorbic acid. You want to use the L-ascorbic acid. That's the enantiomer that does stuff. So the product should say L-ascorbic acid and most skincare products will say L-ascorbic acid. That's another potent tyrosinase inhibitor. And then lastly, Arbutin, often sold as like alpha Arbutin. There's beta as well. Alpha is the one that is preferable. Alpha Arbutin is actually a derivative of hydroquinone, but it's a safe derivative. Um, so it doesn't have the carcinogenic activity. It doesn't cause ochronosis. It's obviously also then not as effective, but it is still very effective and it gets metabolized in the skin to hydroquinone. So it kind of uses the same mechanism in a very safe way. So that will be one of the other tyrosinase inhibitors. So I'm now going to talk about things that help with hyperpigmentation from a different mechanism. So the things I'm talking about now aren't tyrosinase inhibitors. So the first one is niacinamide. If you watched my Is My Skin Dry or Dehydrated video, you'll know that I'm a niacinamide stan. It doesn't actually do very much for hyperpigmentation, although it does a little bit. Um, and it's not by blocking tyrosinase. What niacinamide does is it blocks the melanocytes from transporting the melanin they've made into your skin. Does that make sense? So, so the melanocytes are making melanin, but what normally happens is they get carried into the keratinocytes, which are the skin cells, and it basically stops that. So your body makes the melanin but it doesn't go where it's trying to go. So you can't actually see it in the skin. And it, it doesn't do that very well. Like it's not that effective. 
but it does that a little bit and niacinamide has so many other benefits for the hydration of your skin how moist and supple your skin looks um, it can also help with things like congested skin so like fine spots so i'm a niacinamide stan but it doesn't actually do that much for hyperpigmentation so that's just again something to bear in mind so it's not an essential part of this hyperpigmentation routine although it will help a little bit and it's just good for your skin in general the next non-tyrosinase inhibitor that I want to promote is the alpha hydroxy acids. Alpha hydroxy acids don't directly reduce pigmentation but they can be very helpful with reducing skin pigmentation and I'll tell you how. So alpha hydroxy acids are chemical exfoliants. They're very popular these days so I feel like you probably might have heard of them. Alpha hydroxy acids, so they're chemical exfoliants. What I mean by that is historically like people often used to use like a physical exfoliant so you would use a face wash that has lots of beads or granules in and you'd like rub it into your skin and what you're doing is you're, you're physically getting rid of that top layer of dead cells whereas a chemical exfoliant is an acid that's kind of just dissolving the dead skin on your face so alpha hydroxy acids basically increase the rate of like seeing the new skin cells come up to the surface because you're getting rid of the dead skin cells by like exfoliating them chemically it's also been proven that they increase the collagen and the elastic fiber production of your skin so your skin looks plumper and more elastic so they're really good in that sense as well so they don't directly reduce your pigmentation but they speed up the process of treatment does that make sense if you're using alpha hydroxy acid you're just making this process a little bit faster one thing that's really important to consider in skin of color is which alpha hydroxy acid you're going to use so the three main ones are glycolic acid lactic acid and mandelic acid so glycolic acid the molecules are the smallest and it has the highest bioavailability then it's lactic acid, then it's mandelic acid. So mandelic acid is the biggest molecule and has a lower bioavailability. I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. So the bioavailability is how much, when you put it on your skin, how much actually penetrates through your skin and starts doing stuff. So because glycolic acid is the smallest and has the highest bioavailability, it's the most likely to go all the way through your skin and actually start doing stuff at the deeper levels of your skin. While that may sound good, it's actually not good at all for skin of colour. Because it penetrates so deeply, if it is irritant or if it is too strong for your skin, the concentration, your skin is much more likely to react to it. Whereas because mandelic acid, the molecule is so big, it doesn't go in as far. It's not as bioavailable, not as much as absorbed into the skin. And so it works more slowly than glycolic acid does, but it's much safer and it's much less likely to irritate your skin. And as I said, the strand that's going to be running through this whole conversation is not irritating your skin because... If you irritate your skin, that causes inflammation, that will make your hyperpigmentation worse. You want everything to be gentle, gentle, soft, soft, cute, cute. I don't want anything to be like too intense or chemical burning or whatever. So mandelic acid is the alpha hydroxy acid of choice for skin of colour. And remember, it doesn't directly work on the pigmentation, but it accelerates the rate of producing um, kind of new cells because you're getting rid of the dead cells. Woo! Okay, the other really important thing to consider is that the alpha hydroxy acids to be fair most things here make you very photosensitive so they make you sensitive to the sun and sunlight so obviously everyone should be wearing sunscreen all the time anyway but when you're doing any of these treatments like i literally i literally can't stress enough how important it is that you're wearing sunscreen like i cannot if there's one thing that i want you to take away from this video please wear sunscreen at all times especially if you're doing any if you're doing any of this like absolutely you need to be having sunscreen on your person at all times like and and i do sometimes think like this is obviously really long and it's something that like non people not of color just don't have to do any of these things but then i realized like it is just the price to pay for having like beautiful melanin skin that like actively protects you against cancer and stays young and doesn't age as badly do you know what i mean so while like there are obviously loads of concessions i just think we do get lots of really good things as a result and that's also why all these treatments none of them depigment your skin so none of them are bleaches they'll just return your skin to its normal skin tone because that's not something i endorse or ever would so i hope that's very clear the other thing i want to say about alpha hydroxy acids is their humectants so they have high gross as i was about to say that word i just thought I explained a complicated word with another complicated word but so alpha hydroxy acids are humectants they are hygroscopic what i mean by that is they pull water in from the environment so they keep your skin moist so if i have a so if i've used my mandelic acid that's going to draw water from the environment into my skin so the air around you is literally going to be a tiny bit drier because some water is getting pulled into your skin 
so that's part of the reason it's so so important to use a good moisturizer after you've used an alpha hydroxy acid because they're hygroscopic and they pull water if the air is really dry or you don't have a water filled moisturizer on top to pull water from they'll just pull water from deeper within your skin does that make sense so if they can't find any water to pull into your skin they'll just pull it into your skin the other way so dehydrating your skin to pull some water out to that top level of your skin so if you're going to use an alpha hydroxy acid one of the other things is it's really really essential that you put a nice moisturizer on top oh okay so that took ages but now that that's over i think it's time to talk about the actual pigmentation routine so dr annie's pigmentation routine this is what i want you to do and i hope you feel like you know why you're doing each thing now okay so the first rule so i lied actually i'm going to give you a few guidelines before i give you the routine itself um, and these are absolute must do's and must don'ts before you do any of this so the first one is always wear your sunscreen we spoke about this physical is better than chemical i'll get into that another time because i've been rambling for a long time physical is better than chemical sunscreen breaks down every two hours so you guys need to be reapplying that you know there are sunscreen powders you can put i say that they're quite hard to find this is why i need please someone invest in me so i can have a skincare brand because it's quite hard to find sunscreen powders that work on dark skin and i would absolutely invent that shit if someone gave me some money so use a sunscreen powder if if you want to reapply on top of your makeup if you're lucky enough to be able to find one in your color so always reapply your sunscreen with a sunscreen powder if you can remember that if anything is irritating your skin you absolutely need to stop that shit because if it burns your skin if you get chemical burns from the mandelic acid or from the azelaic acid or from any of these things because it's been too strong or your skin's just irritated by it that is going to cause hyperpigmentation so just don't think let me get the maximum percentage of the things i've said because literally you will cause more hyperpigmentation if your skin doesn't like it you know so you want to go gentle with everything and you will see such fantastic results so that is actually what we call paradoxical post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. When you get more pigmentation from inflammation trying to treat the pigmentation, like that's why they call it a paradox. So paradoxical post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is real. That's a real thing. And that's obviously literally getting hyperpigmentation trying to treat hyperpigmentation because, but, but that won't happen to you because I know you guys are going to listen. So the next thing is never use any, so, all, so this routine I'm going to give you all of the stuff is at night time. And the reason it's at night time is because these things make you more photosensitive. So I want you to be able to have them on your skin. When I say photosensitive, I mean light sensitive, like to the sunlight. So I want you to be able to have these things on your skin and just go to sleep and not have any sunlight or any lights hitting you. Does that make sense? So that's why I'm saying do all of this stuff at night. And it's not because, you know, at night time your skin's regenerate. It's not anything funky like that where your skin's regenerating, it'll absorb it better. It's literally because I don't want the sun to react on your skin that has these things that are making your skin more sensitive to said sun. Does that make sense? These things make you more vulnerable to sun damage. So why not wear them at night when you're not in the sun? And then in the morning, wash them off carefully and put your sunscreen on. But I'll tell you what to do AM and PM. But yeah, these actives should never go on during the daytime. And the other rules were always wear your sunscreen, always reapply every two hours. And remember, go gentle because paradoxical post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is a real scourge and it's a real thing and it will ruin your life. Okay, and then the last one is the one that's the least essential, but this is one that is important for me. Avoid fragrance in skincare because that shit is just totally unnecessary. I have very sensitive skin, so if I use perfumed products, I get contact dermatitis, so my skin gets a little bit eczema-y, like a bit, bit rashy. And that doesn't happen to everyone, but even if you don't react to fragrance, it sensitizes your skin. So your skin becomes more sensitive, is more likely to develop allergies to fragrance and things like that. And it's just hella unnecessary. So if you can find like moisturizer and things like that without fragrance, that's always better. Okay, so the bit that everyone's been waiting for. So I'm going to tell you the thing I want you to do in the evening, and then I'm going to tell you the thing I want you to do in the morning, because the evening routine is a bit more complex. So... And the other thing is for the PM routine, I want you to do it two hours before bed. And the reason for that is because you're going to be putting loads of stuff on your face. I don't want you to put it all on your face, go to sleep and it just all ends up on the pillow. Like I want your skin to have a moment to like, like really take it in, you know, before like I want it to dry and kind of absorb into your skin before you just literally get it all over the pillow instead of just going straight to bed. And it's like fresh on your face and it literally just gets rubbed off. 
so do try and do all of this like at least two hours before bed so the first step is just wash your face cleanse if you have worn makeup i tend to say double cleanse so wash your face once to get the makeup off and then wash your face again to actually wash your skin and then i want you to tone your skin so mandelic acid toner i think is ideal so just get it on a cotton pad and just swipe it over your face it's focusing on the areas where you have the hyperpigmentation and the other thing i want to say is depending on which mandelic acid toner you get you need to read that specific one because some are formulated that they're gentle enough to be used every day others are quite strong so you should only be using them you know twice a week max so obviously it depends on the one you get but first step cleanse second step tone with your mandelic acid toner now this is the fun part the active so the actives are the ingredients that are actually doing stuff for your skin and at this point hopefully you remember why you're using each thing so once you've cleansed your face you've toned it with your mandelic acid toner i then want you to layer alpha arbutin and kojic acid as serums then your l ascorbic acid which is your vitamin c and then your azelaic acid so i literally want you to put them on in that order um, and I said azelaic acid last because I think normally that one is like a, um, the formulation of it is a bit thicker. So it should go on after the other serums. Alpha arbutin, kojic acid, the vitamin C, which is the L-ascorbic acid and then azelaic acid. And you don't have to use all of these. And in fact, what I recommend is I've said all four at once, but I recommend that you start one every week. Because if you start using them all at the same time and you find that your skin is irritated by something, you're not going to know which one caused the irritation. So I want you to introduce a new one, maybe every Friday or something, and then you know, okay, my skin is not enjoying the kojic acid. I'll take that out and I'll use the rest of the routine. Uh, obviously focusing on the areas that you've got high pigmentation. And if anything is causing any irritation, get rid of it. That's why there's so many, I've given you four actives. You don't need to be using all four. So you can just find a combination that works for you. But I think most people will be able to tolerate all four, especially at kind of lower percentages where they're not so irritant. So alpha butin kojic acid, your L-ascorbic acid, which is your vitamin C, and then azelaic acid. Then you want to moisturize. Moisturizing is important anyway, because it kind of creates a healing environment for your skin. But it's also important because we spoke about how the mandelic acid and some of these products are humectants, so hygroscopic. They're drawing water into your skin. So you want it to draw water from the moisturizer and from the air. You don't want it to be drawing water from deeper in your skin. I hope that makes sense. So you've got your actives on and because some of them are humectants pulling water, I want them to pull water from the moisturizer, not from my skin, which is why it's essential to put a moisturizer on top. The other thing that the moisturizer is good for is it can kind of dilute some of these down a little bit, which is always nice because you are obviously putting a lot of active ingredients on your face. So the last step is I want you to use an occlusive. An occlusive is something you put on your skin that forms a barrier between your skin and the stuff you've put on it and the outside environment. So what I mean is literally just like a thick layer of Vaseline or like Aquaphor. And what that will do is it'll seal all that stuff in and mean that like that stuff can't like evaporate from your skin. Um, so seals all the goodness in. So a nice occlusive. Um, so Vaseline and Aquaphor are really good examples of occlusives. And the next question is how long will it take to see results? So I have a very scientific answer for that as well. So to know how long it'll take results, you need to kind of understand the skin cycle, the epidermal skin cycle. So your epidermis, the main layer of the skin that you're familiar with, the main layer of the skin that you can actually see it has five layers and it takes five to six weeks for the whole thing to be replaced so to use me as an example the skin that's shedding right now like if i just scrubbed my face the stuff that would come off was made six weeks ago does that make sense so it takes six weeks for the skin to regenerate and we say skincare normally takes two to three cycles for you to see results. So it's going to take a minimum of 12 to 18 weeks to see results. So that is how long you should be doing this. And I'm sorry if that's not the answer you wanted to hear, but I'm coming with the facts. Like this is the T. It will take 12 to 18 weeks. The actual truth is five to six weeks is an average. The younger you are, the shorter the cycle is. So in teens, the cycle is actually two to three weeks. And then people in their 50s and 60s the cycle is more like eight to 12 weeks but five to six weeks is a good average for most people and it will take two or three cycles for you to see good results so that's so if we say six weeks 12 to 18 weeks exactly um so that's the minimum amount of time that you should be doing this and you should see fantastic results and obviously we came up with a little hashtag use the hashtag i want to know how it's going because it will work like i know this works 
Okay, I feel like I've spoken for ages. I'm gonna stop talking now. I hope this made sense. I really would love feedback and critique and comments. And obviously if you could like and subscribe, I'd be so, so grateful. Um, I hope this is the step to everyone having like the skin they want. Um, and thank you so much if you made it to the end because I know that it was quite a long video and I hope it will form a good reference point for people as well. Like this is, I hope this will be some information that everyone can refer back to. Okay, thank you so much and goodbye everyone. Yeah. Dirty, dirty. How we let it get like this, I don't know.